Yo, this is Jumping Jack Frost, and welcome to the Frost Report. Boom! Boom. everyone, welcome to another edition of The Frost Report. The devastating cost mentally and financially of the pandemic has finally been laid bare with official figures released this week. Pressures of lockdown, job losses and furlough has led to enormous increases in domestic abuse, rocketing numbers of children in legal rows with separated parents and a huge increase in divorce rates. Social workers have been unable to carry out visits to struggling families, leading to a huge fall in adoptions coupled with overburdened family courts. The Ministry of Justice has been overwhelmed with cases of violence against women with senior judges warning they are unable to cope with pressures of litigations and accusations of domestic abuse. Before the pandemic, divorce rates were at the lowest ebb since the hedonistic 1970s. However, over 112,000 divorce petitions went through the courts in the last 12 months, the highest in 30 years. The pandemic saw major increases in domestic violence and negations with almost 40,000 restraining orders made during 2020. Feelings of isolation on the, on the individual have rocketed too, with suicides at an all-time high. This week we have four special guests that work within the mental health arena um, and we're going to get their take on the last 12 months. Joining us this week on the Frost Support will be Ellie Telbian, business coach, radio presenter and non-profit expert, Paris Civet, multi-instrumentalist, music producer, DJ presenter and label owner, Carly Wilford, producer, DJ and presenter, and Professor Catherine Loveday, neuropsychologist who specialises in the fascinating arena of memory music and neurodevelopment. Excuse me for that, I'll get my... Right, get myself a bit of thing. But uh, what I'm going to ask you ladies to do is to um, just talk a little bit about yourselves and what you do so we can get a, a more accurate um, information about you. So starting with Paris, would you like to tell me a little bit about yourself? So I'm Paris. I've been in the music business for about 15 years. DJ, producer, musician. I released an album in 2018, was number one for five weeks. And just kind of after that after so many years being in it I kind of felt another life in in a different field so I'm now a corrective exercise specialist personal trainer and currently training to be a metaphysician great stuff Ellie would you like to tell us some more about yourself Paris that's all amazing that's fantastic. <laughs> thank you I'm Ellie Slevian I'm a radio presenter hypnotherapist and I work in the community and voluntary sector too, around mental health and helping children and young people. I've been working in the music industry for around 15 years, and I've been working in the community and voluntary sector for about 17 years. All of my work is around creating kinder, nicer communities, and I try to do that with the lens of music around me. Beautiful, beautiful. Carly, can you tell us more about yourself? Of course, I'm a DJ and music producer. I've been in the music industry for about 10 years. Before I did this, I was a personal trainer and spent a lot of time working with people not only on their physical health, but on their mental health. So when I stepped into the music industry, I realized that we weren't really doing this very well. And I really wanted to spend more time helping musicians to feel healthier and more balanced. So I set up a well-being platform called Alive. It's been going for around about the last 12 months, um, not knowing obviously we had a pandemic around the corner but it offers loads of support, help and link to therapists. And we also do online guided meditations as well. Great stuff. Uh, Professor Catherine Loveday, will you tell us more about yourself and your fascinating work? Hi, uh, I'm Catherine and I'm a professor of neuropsychology. So what that means is I'm interested in how that big lump of stuff inside our head makes us who we are and how it can be affected by what goes on in our lives and our environment and so on. Um, I have been researching things like memory for a long time, but I'm also a musician. And so for the last 10 to 15 years, I've been particularly interested in sort of the role that music plays in our lives. 
um, and I and how it helps us to remember stuff, but also how it can be really good for our well-being. And then in the last few years, I've been working with George, George Mudsgrave and Sally Ann Gross at the university to start looking at what happens to musicians who, where where music is an integral part of their life and can really support well-being, but where it can also um, present lots of stresses and strains. And so I guess that's where I. Um, particularly interested at the moment. Oh, great stuff. Well, I'd like to thank you all to the Frost Report. Thank you so much for your time and for taking part. I'm going to be asking a series of questions. The first one, I'd like to ask everyone, and I'd like to everyone's take on this. Uh, there'll be questions that I'll ask everyone to answer, and there'll be some specific questions for um, specific people. So I'm going to start off like this, all right? We are taught PE at school from when we are very small. Should mental health be part of the curriculum? And should, I be should our children be taught mindfulness, meditation, and how to discuss feelings and problems when they're down? Do you think that this should be part of the curriculum? Starting with you, Paris, what do you think about this? Well, actually they are. So my son is, is eight and I can never forget the day when he came home with the, the new classroom kind of management system they have between the school and the teachers. And it, it's called the class dojo. And they actually have like meditation moments and they do Pokemon yoga. And I was sat back to say, oh my goodness, that means this next baby of generation is going to be so open and so awake to uh, the things that we've had hidden for so many years. The power that they're going to have is amazing. So yes, I think it needs to be, I don't know if it's in every school, but particularly my son's school, I definitely think that is something that has been denied from for so many of us I always say I think it's been underestimated the power of mindfulness and and uh internal growth so I think it's really good that now that is starting to be taught with the next generation but it has to be a, definitely a, a country national movement for sure all right thank you thank you um Ellie what do you think about that I know that you that you run workshops and stuff like that so what do you think of it being taught as a part of the, the school curriculum yeah, so it is actually now compulsory in primary and secondary schools alongside RSHE. And that was around 2019, 2020. But I think as the pandemic, it hasn't been rolled out completely. Like you, Paris, I have an eight-year-old son. Um, he's a big advocate for mental health. And he actually did a presentation on mental health because um, he loves what I do. So last year he went into school and he did this whole speech about mental health, which was very, very cute, which I helped him to write. I think it's really important that it takes place in school. A lot of the work that I've done in schools is around assertiveness training, bullying prevention. I've recently been doing these connect workshops with young carers where they come and meet with me every week online and just tell me what's on their mind. Um, we do some really nice work around emotional literacy. Lots of schools take on different programs depending on what services are in their area and what's available to them. So where I live in Brighton and Hove, lots of the schools have a whole school approach to something called protective behaviours. Protective behaviours is about learning a personal safety continuum and being able to speak out about abuse. It's about emotionally, emotional literacy and being able to say when you feel safe and unsafe. So I think it is happening in schools. It is a movement, but for me, it's not just about it happening with the children and us creating this amazing next generation of well-balanced kids that can talk about their emotions. It's also about what's there for the teachers, what's there for the parents, what are the schools doing to actually make this completely holistic. Uh, that's really important to me, I think, as well. But yeah, the schools, the schools are on it and I'm so glad they're on it. My son and I, we meditate every night before bed, whether he likes it or not. Um, that's part of our routine. Fantastic. And Carly, what do you think? I just think that it's something that all of us need to do. And I think actually the kids are probably way ahead of so many of us. And you know what? Meditation can be whatever you want it to be. It doesn't have to be this whole dedicated thing where you have to spend half an hour a day doing it. It can be when you're going for a walk, being more mindful, being more aware of your thoughts. And I think actually now, and especially during the pandemic, there's so much available to us, but it's just about making that decision to step into it. Um, but also, I think it's a really exciting time for all of this. And I think, you know, there's so many amazing new platforms and voices that are appearing in this space. And especially within the music world, I think, you know what, it's something that hopefully when our world starts to go back to normal, hopefully more of us will be more aware of. Yeah, great stuff. Catherine? 
Yeah, it's really heartening to hear all of this. I've got two children, one's 19 and one's 14, so they're a bit older, but actually my 14-year-old um, also won a competition with a group of them designing an app for mental health. So I think between us, we're obviously producing a generation of people who are who are going to kind of take this agenda forward, which is fantastic. Um, I absolutely think this stuff should be taught in schools 100%. What I would say as a scientist is that I am very keen that these things are evidence-based and well thought out because there is a tendency for um, big companies to come into schools and say, we've got the answer, we can run this for you, we can do this, we can do that. And um, it's very easy for schools to kind of just take what is given to them and not necessarily um, know what things are good and what things aren't. And so I do see quite big mistakes being made sometimes. So absolutely it should happen, but we we need at a national level to be sort of developing policies and looking at the evidence base. And I think the other thing is that um, although I also think it's massively important that we we build resilience and individual resilience and we help children to develop those strategies, I'm also aware and it sort of touches on what Ellie just said, that we need to be thinking about this at a much bigger society systemic level. And there is a tendency in our individualistic world to say this is about making the individual stronger and more resilient. And yes, that needs to happen, but but we shouldn't be putting all that emphasis on the individual. We need to look at what's going, going on in society at a systemic level that is creating the problems that people need this resilience. So um, I, I think while I think it's brilliant and it has to be done, we need to attack it from both angles. Great stuff. Yeah, you could raise a child within a school setting to be really mentally health savvy, but if they go home, and that isn't embedded where they're living or their parents don't believe in mental health, which you will get lots of parents that still have that attitude, then there's a limit to how far that child's development around mental health and, and being safe and stuff can actually go. So, yeah, it is that whole approach. Yeah, definitely. And, 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 and I think just basically the, the concept of, of having a sort of, a, you know, a, a society where there are, there are fewer inequalities and, and, and things that the environmental stuff that creates the mental health problems are, are the things we also need to be attacking massively. 100%. 100%. Anyone else got anything to say on that before we move on to something else? No? All right, then. So um, we're going to go back to a conversation that um, Catherine... Carly and Ellie, we were on the panel at the Brighton Music Festival and we had a very interesting conversation. And I'm going to continue um, a subject that we spoke about in depth. We really didn't have time to really go into it. So before the pandemic, DJs would fly around the world, being the centre of attention at a party where everyone looks up to them, like, you know, life and soul of the party, everyone wants to be your friend. The pandemic, pandemic comes, we're not DJing anymore. There's no more parties. The music stopped. It affects us. It surely affects. It's affected me, and it must have affected um, all, or everyone in our sector. So, um, starting with you, Kylie, has has this affected your mental health? Not being able to perform and not being able to do what you love has has it affected you? Yeah, of course. I mean, the thing is, I found what I love doing for a living, and I think not being able to do what you love every single day is very, very hard. Not only because it's your purpose. It's what you're here to do. Um, the music industry is also an amazing space for creatives. And linking into that, to say, for example, you go to a gig and you bump into someone you haven't seen for ages. It's your tribe. It's your crew of people. And all of a sudden, that's been completely stopped. And I think so many of my friends in music have really struggled. I have days where I feel like, yeah, I've got this. And other days where I'm like, what on earth is going on? especially as we step into a year of this now I think it's been very very hard and and like you've just said you know you've had days when this isn't so easy and you know there's no end date there's no there's nothing that's saying right you've only got to do a year and then this is going to come back so I think taking each day is really important but also I'm really lucky during this time I decided to learn to make music so in many ways it's been a blessing but I do sometimes think if I didn't have that, I don't know where I'd be because it has been really, really difficult. Yeah, really. Ellie, how about you? Yeah, I love I love what Carly was just saying and that whole do what you love thing. And I think what it's done for me is kind of made me go, well, what, for one, and I started working, I went back to my roots of working in community and voluntary sector. That's what I did because there were parts of my business and sort of my approach to mental health and the music industry where I had to just hang back for a bit 
I said this at Brighton Music Conference, I didn't want an ambulance chase. You don't want to be that person when everybody's going through hell going, well, actually, if you give me some money, I'm going to sort that out for you. I don't want to be that person. It doesn't sit well with me. It doesn't make me feel good, which is why I generally end up helping people for free. And <laughs> my phone rings a lot. So it's about doing what you love. Um, and, and I also think it's about that question in my head has been like, well, how do I stay relevant to this, but carry on doing the thing that is actually paying my bills right now? Because that's really important. Do you know what I mean? I'm a single parent. Um, I love working in the music industry and I want to do all of those things. But how much do I need to say yes to that actually isn't paying? And I know so many DJs, producers, artists have, have basically done everything for free over the last 12 months, haven't they, more or less? So that must make you feel a certain way. That is going to be a concern as we go back into a paid industry. What I was thinking about the other day, as you start seeing gigs pop up and stuff like that, is what I'm looking forward to. So rather than thinking about the ways it's impacted me, I'm thinking about what am I looking forward to? Who am I looking to go, looking forward to going out with? And what I'm not looking forward to isn't actually oh, I'm going to see this person, see that person. It's, I'm really looking forward to seeing strangers, which might sound nuts, but that's my favourite bit about working in the industry and going out is knowing that you'll go out. And you'll just have a great time with people you don't even fucking know yeah. um, because the music's so good and because you're all so happy to be there and you know how privileged you are to be there. So I'm really excited about meeting loads of people I've never met before and having all those little interactions that feel so good. Yeah. So, but yeah, of course it's affected me. It's affected everyone around me. And it's a sad thing to see people's creativity go like this right at the start of the pandemic where they're pushing themselves and now what I'm seeing around me is that real dip where people are like actually I've lost my mojo now like for me and the people around me I think this has been one of the toughest months yeah I totally agree there's been very very tough how about you Paris um it's funny because my music industry experience has been nothing but trauma for 15 years to be honest I'll be you know this is we're here to be frank so it's been nothing but trauma for 15 years so I actually had the opportunity to find a piece in myself that has not existed in 15 years which you know you can put it down to the amount of things but you know being listed as as you know I was a position of like one of the top 20 producers for 2018 in the world and still finding yourself kind of left in challenging positions, I decided that, yeah, this would be a time to find more peace. So as much as I miss the people in, you know, you would see in the club, in the business, the music lovers and the people dancing, I've used that as an opportunity to find myself. So in my circumstance, I think actually the pandemic saved me, to be honest with you. Catherine, part of your academic research is focused on the onstage and offstage pressures of performers. Can you tell us a little bit more about this? Yeah, so I think one of the, the things with perform not being able to perform in the pandemic is has been picked up by many people here. So Carly's point about not having your tribe and not having that social connection is really, really quite significant on people because that is partly what we makes us survive as human beings. And I think um, also just the, the idea of it being meaning and purpose and being able to create for somebody to listen to that. I think um, those things are, are hugely important, but also the uncertainty. I think Ellie spoke about the, the sense that you never know when this is going to end. And as human beings, we don't deal well with uncertainty. We like to predict. We like to know what's coming. And it's very stressful to be in a perpetually uncertain situation. It's like driving into the fog. But I think Paris's point is also hugely relevant because um, it, some people have done better through the pandemic. Some people have have felt that that the step back from all the pressures that go uh, go on in the music business or in any other area of our life, um, by, by removing those or reducing those, some people have actually benefited. And this is what we know from the research is that while some people have been in much more stressful situations, other people have actually had the opposite impact. And it's really interesting to see what are the factors that are causing some people to be better off and some people to be to be more stressed and more, you know, in a, a more difficult situation. So we're going to we're going to move on as the world slowly returns to normal. We must be mindful that the fragile mental state of the whole nation has decreased dramatically. What steps should we all take daily to keep our mental and emotional fitness on point? This is a question for everyone. I'd like everyone to, 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 to tell me what they think of this. Starting with Carly, what do you think? I really think it's about checking in with the people that you love and being there for one another. And I think even though we can't see each other physically yet, I think it's really about making sure that 
you know, I don't know about you, but my connections with people have changed over the last year. I don't speak to as many of my friends. I don't see my family as much. And so I think checking in with people is just so, so important. Just picking up the phone. How are you? How have you been? And just making sure that they're okay, because sometimes people go quiet and they're not okay. And you wouldn't know if you weren't that person checking in. So I think that's something that we all need to do more often. And especially within the music industry, I think, you know, we've spoken, Paris said that this this time saved her. And I think actually that is the same for a lot of people. But on the flip side of that, I also think there's a lot of people struggling. So what can we do better as humans to make sure we're there for other people? I think that's so important. Yeah, definitely. Um, Ellie, how about you? Yeah, I love what Carly just said, because for me, everything I do is around building a kinder society. So I do a lot of work with young carers and it's kind of like I wouldn't need to do the level of work that I do with young carers if other adults around those families, children, young people were more responsible or if society was a little bit more kinder and a little bit more generous and a little bit more forgiving. I think daily steps. It's about what works for you, isn't it? That's the fun part of locking in, getting down with mental health is that you have to experiment with what works for you. You definitely have to take some responsibility for the people around you. I completely back what Carly's saying about checking in with the people around you and just doing small micro things. Like don't let the kindness that was shown 12 months ago when we first fell into this situation go. Don't leave it, harness it, keep it, embrace it and make that part of your character as we move out of this situation. If you were being super kind to your neighbours once we got into this shit storm, carry on with that behaviour, keep doing all those little things. It's also about doing the things that work for you yourself. I'm sure I'll get into it a little bit more as our conversation progresses, but I'm recovering from COVID at the moment. I have long covid what I found is that I haven't been meeting my usual checklist of things that I do to keep myself feeling safe and keep myself feeling good. At the moment, I would say I'm positioned quite vulnerably and I'm really aware of that where I do lots of work with myself and other people around mental health. I'm able to look at my red flags and go, right, if you don't start doing something now, Ellie, this is what's going to happen or that's going to happen. So it is about getting more in touch with yourself. You know, hopefully over the last 12 months, People are very in touch with what works for them and what doesn't work for them. But don't give that effort up. Keep it up. Be disciplined with it. COVID has caught me completely off guard. Before I caught it, I was maybe running, hit, yoga, walking five times a week. I would come home. I would meditate. I would read the Daily Stoic. I would do all of these lovely practices, do some hypnotherapy. I'm in in a completely different headspace to where I was eight weeks ago and I wasn't expecting this to happen and I'm someone that's really on it with my mental health. Um, So it's about remaining disciplined. Those are the daily things that you can do. You have to treat this like you treat putting food in your body. Thank you. Paris? Exactly what Ellie said there. I think this time, I call it like the great reset almost. It's time now to find your peace and stay there. I think, I think we've had so much time to look at what we did before and how we just, things we took for granted, things we did and things we kind of, ah, do that later. Where now we've realized that, you know, we've kind of been forced to zone in on ourselves and zoom in and, and where we are, what we are. And we've lost so many people around us that it's now when we do come out of this, whatever's left, it's about being kind as, as you know, even Carly said on ourselves, on the people around us and how we can be our best self. And it's taken away that pressure, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Cause I can, I can imagine everyone had goals and set plans before this hit. And of course, everybody's been swiped off their feet. And so here we are now kind of almost looking at every day and spirituality. We're told, you know, there, there is no, future there is no past you know we have now and that's the present and I think that's the most important thing to take each day as it is and we do our best every day and that's all we can do because as we know we've had every power taken from us without any knowledge so I think that's we all we need to hold on to is take each day and do our best today and maybe try and do something that might mean we'll be better tomorrow and see where we go mm-hmm. great stuff um Catherine Well, I have to say that everything that everybody said has been utterly brilliant and really, really well evidence-based, which is just so brilliant for me to hear as a psychologist. And um, 
I think uh, the, the kindness and compassion is is hugely important and it works in both directions and, and the science shows that it works. So being kind to others is good for us. It, it does good things to our body. It does good things to our mind and it helps us be kinder to ourselves as well. So I think Carly's absolutely right about reaching out and looking and, and particularly the people that go quiet. The people who go quiet are in, and, and not and not to be put off by somebody not responding. Um, some people will say that even if they've been messaged, you know, 20 times in the last sort of month and not replied to anything, that message, every single time that message has come, it's made a difference. So that I think is hugely important, but it is absolutely vital, as Ellie says, and as Paris says, that we that we also are kind to ourselves. And those practical things that you've talked about, Ellie, are hugely important. So and 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 that is why it is significant to you that you can't do those, because actually looking after our body. Um, is not a trivial thing. Keeping good sleep, good food, good exercise, those things are not trivial. They make a difference to how our brain functions. So, and they're really practical, simple things that anyone can do. Even if you feel rubbish, you can just go for a sort of 30 minute walk um, if you've got enough physical capacity to do that. So um, those very practical things are important. And, um, and I think also, just recognizing that it's been a hard time and not and not trying to ask too much of yourself. Um, writing has got a good evidence base as well. So for musicians in particular, but for anyone, just writing and it, it, writing anything um, is it makes a difference. So just writing about anything that's difficult can really help. Um, there was something else. Oh, and I suppose the the final thing I wanted to say is that I think. Um, Paris's point about resetting is so important because actually what people have had the opportunity to do here is to reflect and to change certain elements of their lifestyle. And, and so really, I think what people can do is look back over the year and reflect on what have I done that's good? What, have I, what positive changes have I made to my life? And how can I carry those things forward? So if I have slept a little bit more or I have eaten slightly better nutritious food, how can I take that into the post-COVID world with me? Because if you can take that and then regain all the social stuff and everything else, we could all be in potentially a stronger position. And we absolutely, as Ellie said, we have to not, not succumb to the fear the division that is fueled by fear. So we have we are in a fearful place at the moment. People are scared of lots of stuff and, and fear fuels division. We mustn't let that happen. We've got to be kind to others. We've got to always look for the best in people. And we have to work for, I think absolutely, as Ellie says, a kinder society, because if we're kind to other people, it does come back round. Catherine, I just want to jump in there, actually, because I think what you've said is so important. And it's something that I've noticed massively over the last 12 months. When did we as humans stop being friends of people because of their opinion? And I think that is something now, you know, I think this, I think that, I can't like you because you think this. That is absolutely ridiculous for a start. And I think, I don't know about you guys, but I've really been witness to this. And I think it's a really sad state that, we're getting ourselves into where we are feeling divided more than ever over opinion and opinions aren't facts opinion changes and I think that's where we need to be really really mindful of each other because I've really noticed it whether that's family friends twitter do you know what yeah, I mean twitter all is of these really things bad for it. it's the worst and and actually you know what you think today might change tomorrow and it's all of those things I think as a society right now we are being put against each other and you watch it daily mm. and so I absolutely back what you've just said Catherine because I think at a time where you're isolated at a time where you're not seeing the people that you love we're now being you know set against each other over opinion and I think you know you don't always realize it and sometimes you're deep in it no. when it's happening no. but no. I think taking a step back breathing being mindful of each other and and being kind is so important. I've seen this firsthand recently where you have people that have decided to take the vaccine being horribly spoken to and abused 
by people, by, by anti-vaxxers. Like, if you want to take the vaccine, it's up to you. And you've got people that are not speaking to each other because one person decided to take the vaccine and another didn't. It's that serious. People are actually falling out over this, which I find really sad and quite crazy, to be honest with you. But I think, you know, as, as you said, Carly, we're being pitted against each other. It's the environment that we live in, the pressures of lockdown, isolation. It's just got us all crazy, to be honest with you. Do you know what I'm saying? really has, do you know what I mean? We just need to focus on one, you know, what we have in common with people. There will always be something we have in common with somebody, even when they are really different from us. And we need to find that common ground because it's what will unite us as from one human to another. And it's okay to be different. Mm. We're all different. We're all on this planet as individuals. And it's okay to have, you know, be individual. And I think that's, that's what makes us so amazing. And we've got to remember that, you know, we've just got to be mindful when you step into that game, stepping yourself out of it and being being nice to each other. It's really hard, I think, you know, especially what, you know, you're both saying, and I think even Catherine's saying as well, is that it's it's the thing where people talk about, as you say, opinions, but then we're in this time now where race has been thrown up there, equality has been thrown up there, and it's like, where is it opinion and where is it everybody? And then, of course, even with all the violence towards women, where is it opinion? Where is it everybody? And I think that's the hard line that we've really struggled establishing in this time because it's sometimes it's just ignorant. Sometimes, you know, asking someone in the middle of West Country talking about Black Lives Matter, they'd know no better. And they're being thrown back to the wall about these experiences. Men who've been raised around nothing but men, you start to speak to them about female equality they know no better. And I think we've done a really bad job in helping people establish where is it opinion? Where is it right or wrong? And just what you're saying, the reaction has been explosive among people. And I think for me, you know, as a woman who particularly I sit back and I see all of the Black Lives Matter stuff. And then even I look at how I was treating the music business and you see things moving forward. All people need to do is take a a a seat back and you say, actually, all of this from step one to three to four to five could be handled better. And it's just exactly what you're saying, Carly. It's some people's opinion and people who feel hurt by the opinion, you need to step back and think, well, why is that their opinion? And it's that lack of education that I think probably trauma has dealt where people don't have the patience to understand where that opinion come from. And the people with opinion no, don't have the education to understand what their opinion doesn't include. And I think that's what we need to get better at as a society for sure is where is it opinion? Where is it like, that's not opinion, that's not right. I think when we fix that, things will become so much clearer. It's about being able to facilitate healthy debates, right? And looking mm. at what does that look like? What does that mean? How how equipped are we to actually have those debates? You know, this week on a client call, we spoke about some of the topics that we're going to bring up later. And there were moments where it got a little bit heated, you know, uh, but it's being able to handle those debates and go into them with a good heart and walk away from them, trying not to judge people or just taking a moment and going, okay, well, they have a a hesitance around that issue and it might be my job to give them some more answers before they can decide what their opinion actually is and stuff like that so I think shaping creating an environment where people can debate healthily is a really important thing and and I don't know how we do that right now because all all of our opinions seem to be clustered onto social media (laughs) and therefore it's very different and we're all on social media all day we can pretend we're not I mean, Catherine might not be, um, <laughs> but, but I think I think we sort of are, aren't we? You know, that's where we're getting most of our sources from because we're not having those face to face interactions um, in normal settings where we have those debates healthily. Anyway, rambling, COVID rambling. So, what I wanted to I wanted to to, to move on to. Oh, it's a question for everyone: Should safety be part of the curriculum for when children are young? How can we teach boys? How, how can we teach boys to become men who women don't fear in the streets? How can we make it an instinctive thing that women can walk home safely? Because this is a real concern at the moment. And I've, I've seen this morning that some schools are going to start putting this on the curriculum from next year. And I'm hoping that it will be rolled out across the whole, across all schools in England. Because I think it's something that, that we need to look at. What do you think? Um, starting with Paris, what do you think? I think it's amazing. You know, I think the biggest thing we're battling in society now is that there are more years of women being told how not to get raped than being told people who rape being told not to rape. 
And I think that's the issue we're, we're in, that there are more years on that than we, we are in, in the progressive way. So I think it's really, really important that we, we do get that in there. And of course, it's even, it's, you know, it's not, it's rape in, in general. So it's just rather being informed we need to teach better what consent is and understand that that, that is not right. And yeah, it, it's more about the education of that rather than saying that, well, she made herself the victim or he made himself the victim. I think it's very important that we, we do take a step back and put that in the curriculum and we change that society. But with that, there's a whole lot that needs to grow with that also. Carly, what's your views on this? Oh, I mean, this has been something that's been going on since the beginning of time. And so trying to change this overnight might not happen, but I do think we need to be having these conversations. And I think there's been so much that's happened um, in my own life and been so much that's happened to people that I've seen around them where this has just become part of it and it's not okay. And it's something that we need to do better. We need to call people out on it. We need to educate our children. That's where it starts at home, you know, and then, yes, definitely bring that into the curriculum. But I think it's something as a society we need to shift. And it shouldn't just be with children. It should definitely be with adults and the way that we are with one another. And I think it's such a big question. And I think it's such a huge subject. And I don't even know in our lifetime if it's something we'll ever sort out. But I hope and I pray that we can keep taking steps towards this because it's something that, as a woman, as a female, especially in music, is something that I've been amongst a lot of, you know, even if it's, I remember early days, right? Early days of my first job and I was doing recruitment in Northampton and I remember I used to work in the town centre and I lived in the town centre. And I remember leaving the office and holding my breath until I walked home because there were times where I'd look behind me and someone was following me. And I remember I used to do the breakfast show on rinse, right? And I used to get the train early on in the morning. I had to be on air for seven some days. So I'd be travelling from like one area of East London to another area of East London. And I'd be I'd be followed on the way to radio early in the morning, bright as day. And I'm quite, I'm quite, I see, I see myself as being quite strong, but that doesn't mean you can't be terrified of those situations. And I remember running into a shop in East London and saying to the guy behind the counter, because it was the only thing that was open, I was like, help me. There is a man following me and I don't know what to do. And the guy was just glazed over didn't want didn't want to didn't want to be part of the conversation so I went out of that shop and I got myself a bike I, and I remember being because I was walking I was like I went and got a Boris bike and I hopped on it and I phoned my producer on radio being like mate I'm gonna be late I've got this guy following me but I confronted this person and I remember shouting like what do you want and I looked him in the eye and I said what do you want from me and this guy was big and it was terrifying and not so many people are that lucky and not so many people have had those situations end that way. And I think, you know, when is that going to change? Yeah, Carly just said something really important. I mean, I've got lots to add to that. But the most important thing that might be said in this whole call and this whole conversation is what you just said, where he didn't want to be part of that conversation. <laughs> because that is what women come up against. That is what we are permanently up against is men not wanting to be part of the conversation. So the men that maybe aren't doing that kind of stuff, that aren't behaving in that way, but they're not standing and they don't want to be a part of the conversation. Or you can go to a man and you can tell them something's happened with a man they know and they don't want to be part of that conversation. They don't want to it's hear it. It's not all it. just men either. It's not all just no. men, is it? Sometimes it's females too. No. Yeah, 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 you're right. I mean, we, so you spoke about education and sort of safety being in education. That's what protective behaviours is. Protective behaviours is this continuum where you learn about what feels safe, what doesn't feel safe and how to express that as a child or young person. It's a really great thing. So if they're going to put that in schools all over the land, that would be amazing because it's an excellent foundation for children to really understand their emotions. And it's good for adults too. I use it in some training scenarios with adults because actually adults don't always listen to their bodies. And it's not just about listening to your gut. 
actually your body tells you in lots of different micro ways when you're uncomfortable, but often we continue rolling with something and we continue to be present with something and we ignore it and we ignore it and we ignore it until it's too late. So it's kind of like, a again, back to the mental health tip. It's about a holistic approach. So that can't just be for children learning that. That has to be for their parents learning it, perhaps as a mother or father in an unsavory situation at home. You know, we can't just teach the children this. We have to teach their caregivers how to recognize unsafe situations as well. My education around staying safe, and I've written this down, is my (laughs) mum, the one thing she imparted on me regularly and my sister's, was there's a pervert on every corner. That was literally my mum's education around staying safe. And she said it and she meant it. And I still hear it. Do you know what I mean? I can still hear my mum saying that to me. And then my dad, Muslim Iranian man, his was all men want to get their hand in your knickers. And, and that's it. That's my personal education around safety. But do you know what? It's, it hasn't always kept me safe because I've had situations like Carly's mentioned, and like I'm sure we've all had on this call. But isn't that sad that that had to be my parents' message to me around, around staying safe, just that there's a pervert on every corner and all men want to get their hand in your knickers? You know, there's got to be more of an education than that. It made me very wary of men and I'm kind of grateful for it because it always, but I was maybe brought up to think all men have a hidden agenda. That's crazy. And it's actually what you said, just to bounce off, if I can, if I can say that, you know, you say to people that, you know, it's kind of to listen to their gut, you know, in metaphysics, we teach that as intuition and we teach that as something that is actually stronger than your forethought. And it's if you, that time you feel something in you to cross the road, to take a different track that day, practice listening to that. And we don't know, you know, it's, and it's awful to think that we have to apply it to this, but I can even say, you know, as all of us would have been in, you know, when you finish that gig at five o'clock, six o'clock in the morning, coming back from ministry, that walk back to the elephant and castle station, that, that late night bus, everything, it's awful and of course even coming up you don't get the hotel that sometimes your male counterparts get you've got to head back by yourself and it's that intuition that is what gets you home and gets you safe sometimes and I think everybody whatever and I think hopefully we can teach the children to listen to that as as strong as listening to to someone teaching you. Catherine what's your what's your take on this? Yeah, once again, everyone has has said this brilliantly, I think. Um, I think what you've just picked up, said there, Paris, is absolutely vital, is listening. And um, and I think I, I, I've had these experiences. I guess we've all had these experiences. Um, sometimes people have been supportive, sometimes they haven't. Um, but I, I was really terrified. I had two boys and I was really terrified that these two boys might not get the message. And I I have reflected so much over their whole lifetime. How can I get these messages to them? How can I get them to understand it? And I don't honestly know what I've done or said, but they both do very much have that view. And so it is possible absolutely to teach this, but it's not going to happen automatically because really because of what you've been saying, it's not, it's not until it's recognized at a society level and until we get rid of this division, I mean, already it's like not all men. And that, and as soon as you're getting that kind of being shouted out there, you are never going to be able to teach children stuff because they're going to have parents at home that are saying to them, don't listen to this. So, so again, I'll come back to the same thing. We absolutely, as individuals, we can do everything we can to take it out into schools, to take it to our own children, to get these stories heard and, and even just the statistics of how many women have experienced some level of, of um, intimidation or abuse at any level, it, just getting those statistics out there and, and putting them in front of children and saying that this is the reality of what is going on. Um, I think all of that is really good, but we've just got to continue working at this at a society level. And we have to do that by listening to people and to understand why some people are so resistant to 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 recognizing the problem why are they resistant if we can't understand where that resistance comes from we can't challenge it yeah. i mean as carly said we can't do this overnight but we have got to do it we've got to keep working on it's it definitely a conversation that men need to have more as well and men need to take 
um, responsibility for the safety of women, you know? Um, because it, go, going back to what you just said there, Catherine, this thing, not all men, I find it quite infuriating because if you are not... If you are not a problem to women, then why are you bothered? Do you know what I mean? Why are you bothered that? Why why feel the need to say that? Do you know what I mean? So I'm gonna give I'm gonna say something. Reports of rape have doubled since 2015, yet conviction um conviction rates for rapes are at an all-time low. Does this tell us that rape and sexual offenses against women are not being take, taken seriously? Because rape has doubled since 2015, but yet conviction rate is at an all-time low. What does that tell us about how, about how society is is is, is viewing these uh, atrocious kind of offences that, that, that people are carrying out? I don't think it just tells us about them not being taken seriously. I think it's about that multi-layered situation in that the, the, the victim may actually be in and then whether or not they're worried about victim blaming, whether or not reporting it is going to affect their career or their family life, all of those things. Like we have to wear all of that. We have to think through all of those things. Every time something massive or small happens to us, we have to go, oh, what are the consequences going to be of this? How controversial is this going to be? Because women don't get that easy solution where it's just like, oh, okay, you can report that. And this will happen to that person and that's case closed. It's not as simple as that because there's still so much shame and stigma around this. And then it's back to that point of people not wanting to be part of the conversation. You know, I know people who have had awful things happen to them, but the person that did it, the person responsible for it, no one would believe it. Do you know what I mean? And it's that. It's when you get into that narrative of, well, he couldn't possibly do, do that. He wouldn't ever act like that. He's not like that. You know, and for me, the, the response to your question, Frosty, is it's all of that, isn't it? It's all the layers around a situation and how that makes a person feel. And then they have to live with that for the rest of their lives, uh, which is which is pretty awful. And what support is out there? You know, all we read around rape cases is negativity. That's all we read. We don't read about positive outcomes for the victims. Um we don't read like great stories that make us feel inspired or make us feel good or make us feel like women are getting taken seriously. We just read all of these shit, horrible things where particular men have done this for years and then women haven't had the support system around them to come forward or they've reported it to other men who have done jack shit. And then you get someone with like a 20 year case history of repeated behavior and repeated offenses. You know, that's in our industry. That is happening. I think it's that as well. And then it's even the point is the society where, as you say, you read about a rape and they go, well, why was she out there? Rather than looking like, hold on, she should be able to go out at any time, really. <laughs> you know, and it's it's that culture that, as you say, it probably has an effect to how it gets treated and it's heartbreaking. It's so hard. I want to touch another point. One in three women in the world have been a victim of sexual physical, emotional abuse in their lifetime. Up to 70% of female murder victims around the world are murdered at the hands of an intimate partner. What can we uh, sing, um, what can we do um, singularly and fa as a family, you know, a, a, on a family level and a community level to address this and to keep women and their children safe and to show boys this is not the way to behave? 70% of women around the world, it's, like, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. What can we do to what can we do to change people's behaviours and to to change things on this? I think one thing we can do is to um, be more alert because very often when that stuff is going on inside the home, it's very hidden, and there's a huge amount of gaslighting that goes on with it, where where um, the woman themselves is led to believe that they are the one that's mad and that everything that's happening is their fault and that they have no right to speak out. Um, or people are frankly scared to speak out because of the potential repercussions. Um, and so some of the things we have to do is to make it easier for people to speak up, make it easier for those conversations, I think. And I think there are many ways that this can happen. So for example, I know that occasionally you'll get a storyline in a drama um, where where you watch the whole thing unfold. And those those sorts of things are really important because they go out into people's homes and people can then go, actually, I recognise this. I Either I recognise myself or I recognise the man or I recognise this in my friend. So we have to um, use... I don't think this is just about, you know, throwing the information out there. It's finding really creative ways to help 
people recognize that this is a problem and to recognize when it's happening and to make it possible for those people to speak out and to get out because actually that also relies on there being support for people if they they do make that decision to speak up um but unfortunately i mean i heard a story um just last week of somebody in in um brighton who was stalked um and she was eventually murdered she reported the stalking it was not acted on um she and and ultimately it, it led to her death which is pretty horrific so when people speak out we have to take the risk you know, there's always this, oh, they're crying wolf or there's this. We take that risk. Isn't it better to take the risk that the person is not being truthful and get it wrong? Yeah, it, yeah. It's much more likely that they are being truthful and that they've got a story to tell and that we need to listen to them. Yeah, definitely. Anyone else got anything to add to this? Uh, just that, that when you first posed the question, it made me think of listening to my neighbour's husband beating her up when I was a kid and she was just literally begging through the walls for help. Um, it just reminded me of that. I'd like she was, yeah, she was literally begging through the walls for somebody that could hear to help. And, and the same thing happened when my sister was living in a flat in London. Her neighbour was screaming all the time, and she, uh, yeah, they basically had to had to call the police and get them help. But not everybody does that, and you have to be that brave person that basically goes the extra mile and gets that person help, gets that person support. You have to put yourself on the line. If somebody tells you a truth like that. You've got to put some belief into it. Like you're saying, Catherine, you, you, you could be the person that makes all of the difference to an individual. You, ha you have to be a disruptive, you have to almost be a disruptive adult and break that chain and be that person. Unfortunately, there's not many of those people around, the ones yeah. that don't mind having awkward conversations or getting involved in awkward situations. You know, you have to be that person that makes a difference. You have to believe. It's like when you go into your Tesco's or Sainsbury's every day, you know, don't be a dick to the person behind the counter and they shouldn't be a dick back to you because you might be the only person that seat that, for the rest of the day, right? So you could be serving someone, that customer that comes in, you might be the only person they see for the rest of the day. That interaction could mean everything to them or could have such a lasting effect on them. That's why we have to really have integrity and be true to our word when we meet people, when we see people, all little interactions make a difference and so does standing up for your neighbour that you hear through the walls. Or... Sorry, just one other thing which I think is really important to point out is that we're making this very much about um, the women's perspective, which is really important, but actually this doesn't happen in a vacuum. And one of the other hugely important things, which I know we've already touched on, is making it um, okay for men to talk about their feelings and to talk about their mental health and to not... Um, bottle it all up because that aggression comes from somewhere and of course it comes from from stuff that's going on in society but it also comes from um, men not being able to talk about their feelings and it's interesting to note that the suicide rates for women have gone down but they have they are soaring for men and they are still a real problem and so there is there is a, a general problem where men are more likely to physically act on feelings because there is no outlet to speak about them so that is also hugely important is to make it okay for men to speak and to feel vulnerable yeah i i totally agree there because um the stigma about the stigma for guys to talk about their mental health and their well-being and things that might be on their mind is still very very high it's still really there not a lot of men want to talk about it and not a lot of men want to address their problems and I feel like this is something that we need to work on and we need to change and it does come down to education from the bottom all the way up I believe. So to flip that on you though to flip that on you though Frosty what works for you what helps you to talk about your mental health and be comfortable doing it well uh, I've 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 had various I've had various um I've had various problems with my own mental health and I think that when I, I wrote my book and I spoke about it in, in depth and I think that helped me. That was, my, that was the start of my, that was the start of my therapy and my journey in being able to talk about it. And I, I took great pleasure in people coming to me saying to me, I read your book and I really got a lot out of what you spoke about with yourself. I got a lot from that. And that was my journey. That was the start of my journey, being able to talk about my mental health. Do you know what I mean? And I, 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 I find it very therapeutic and, and it, out of, out of all the pluses of me writing a book, that's what I got the most out of. 
you know what I mean? People coming to me, other guys coming to me saying, thank you for helping me by talking about your mental health. And I think that it is something that as guys, we have to do better to communicate with each other and to talk about it, to have these conversations that need to be had. Because I find women are far better at talking about their mental health than men are. And this needs to change. Men need to speak more about their mental health and to talk to each other more about it as well. You know, be there for each other, not just be like, oh, the big tough guy. Uh, it's the way we were growing up in many cases, but you know, things need to change. You know what I mean? Otherwise, we, we aren't going to get anywhere. And you are evidence of showing up in your own situation, creating the space for others to do the same. I you, but it's been tough. I've got, I've, I've got friends that don't want to talk about it at all. I've got colleagues that don't want to talk about it. Funny enough, the next show, the next Frost Report that I'm doing, I'm going to have four of the biggest names in drum and bass on here talking about their struggles with mental health. And I think that's a that's going to be a huge show because these are all four people that everyone looks up to. And when people, when guys see these guys talking about their struggles with mental health, maybe it would encourage more guys to come forward and speak about their problems and their struggles. And, you know, that's all I want to do is raise awareness for guys to be able to come and, and, and talk about what, what's bothering them and the struggles they have. So, yeah. I'm going to move on. Ask for Angela is a police, police initiative to protect women in bars and nightclubs. We don't have figures on its success rate. Would this work if the female in question, female in question was on full alert, full alert of what's happening? But if she was drunk or even worse, had her drink spiked, do you think there should be a code of conduct throughout the hospitality and entertainment industry whereby if a sole female is found to be very drunk and unable to focus or stand up, help should be given for her to get home? What, do you, what, what are your thoughts on this? Paris? So I was actually spiked. It's actually what stopped me drinking. Um, I was DJing at a nightclub and uh, it was New Year's Eve to, to go into 2018. And I'm someone, I've, I'm, I'm very strong against actually de drinking when I DJ. I love to get my set done, out the way. And then I look at doing it after, you know, just because, you know, it's work. So... Never, ever have I been actually ever drunk at a nightclub because I'm always a female traveling by myself. Also, I've never put myself in that vulnerability. This one time I was spiked and it took me two weeks to get better rather than me being sent home or having support to be sent home. I was sent to my friend's house and nothing was made because the insurance claim no one wanted the conversation for the insurance. Now, I don't know what was put in my drink. I don't know what happened. I don't, all I know is I, I couldn't walk. And I, some point was very sick on the way home to my friend's house. And I'm grateful I was able to go. I was sent to a friend's house that people care for me around me enough to send me to this friend's house. But I actually didn't know this friend well enough to, to even go to, to, to even know where I was. And I think you know, my parents sit back and look, you know, they looked after my son when I went. And this is someone who they know six o'clock in the morning. I'm on the first train back from King's Cross. So they know like this is out of character. I didn't get home till four o'clock the next day. So that I would love to, to make sure that there is a formal system to make sure that one, what was in my system? Because even to this day, I get spurts of, um, labyrinthitis like I felt that I had for two weeks since that point and I would love to know what was in that drink why did that happen and I should have been sent to medical care rather than to a stranger's house what if I would have died in my sleep what if I would have what would have happened and I had that taken away from me for someone who is always working and of course it happens to women everywhere but to know that this was my as far as I was aware this was my safe space. I've been in this business since I was 15 years old. You know, 13 years in, you think, not me. And I was like, wow, it's, it's not safe. And Lord knows what happened. You know, everyone else drinking, no one could pinpoint anything. And even to the point people turn around and say, well, you had one too many. I know damn well I didn't have one too many. And to the point where they're almost laughing at you saying, well, you know, it happens once in a while. I've been DJing with you for three years and this hasn't happened once. I'm sorry. No. 
And especially it doesn't take two weeks to get well. It didn't, it, it wasn't until I actually went to the doctors and they suggested to take some travel sickness tablets that I was well. And I just think to myself, if there would have been just what you're saying, something formally in place, I would have loved to know what happened, but I didn't know what happened. And then there wasn't the support among the people I was around to, they didn't make any extra effort to find out what happened either. They, rather than trust in the person they knew, they just, as you say, they don't jump into that conversation. And that's the reality that we're all living in. Wow. And that's the reality as, as people in the music business. And that, that's that. So yeah, to answer your question, we need that for someone who I now don't drink. That was two years ago. I don't drink because when can you ever trust that again? And it's that classic thing we get told, I'll oh, cover your drinks, walk away. I was working. So the only drinks I had were when I was DJing. So what I meant to DJ with my hand over my drink. And then, then you go to the point, is there enough support for women as their DJ? Where was the security in the box to make sure that that wasn't able to happen. People come in and now they jump around you. We're doing our thing. It's crazy. It's crazy. So yeah, things have to change around that. Has anyone got anything to add to that? Uh, really thank so, you I'm for really sharing. Sorry to hear that, Paris. Just, yeah, thank just, you so thank much you. for sharing that. That must have been really difficult for you to relive that. And thank you. I really appreciate it. I'm yeah, really sorry just, that you had to go through that. I just want to say thanks. Thanks before, because I think Carly wants to speak as well. So I'll wait till after Carly, but thank you very much for sharing that. Because Yeah, that's a really personal experience and and thank you appreciate it Carly? yeah i was i was just gonna say i've had the same thing happen um it's wild and you don't feel well for a long time and you know paris you said about the dj booth i've had exactly the same thing happen i've had to call security like why am i this isn't a cool situation get this person out of the booth like this is not cool I also had my drink spiked in a West End club. I've never actually spoken about this publicly. It was really traumatic. Um, I was sat in the VIP back in the day at um, in like an area where you used to used to get a table, you know, and they're like, "Come on, my table," and I had a glass of champagne, and someone topped up my glass of champagne from our table from a bottle of champagne. And there was Rehypnol, I think, in the bottle of champagne. Um, it was one of the craziest nights of my life. And I remember waking up in a police station and then having to like piece back mm. what had happened. Um, I'd been mugged. I'd been taken by a gang. Um, I got into what I thought was a taxi. And it was a gang car. And they took me to Hounslow and I ended up on an industrial estate in the middle of nowhere. And I don't know what happened that night, but someone was looking over me and someone was helping me because I still look back at that day and I don't know how I was OK. Um, I remember. The crazy situation, but I remember one of the gang members helped me to get away we we ended up at like some random gym in the middle of nowhere Jeez. and I remember they were all talking I remember making a run for the exit and this guy helped me and I'm when you when 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 you've had your drinks by anyone watching this you'll know you lose coordination like your legs don't work like your legs don't work like I couldn't Come I could on. hardly I could you can't walk and so I remember running, trying to run in here. I had heels anyway, trying to run in heels and trying to run away. And the car, a car came round the bend and the gang were in the car and they screamed at this guy because he'd helped me. And he looked me dead in the eye and he looked at the car and he took my bag. And my bag was my phone, my house keys, everything. So I'm standing in Hanzo. Back then, I didn't know where I was. I didn't know where the hell I was. And I had nothing. I had absolutely nothing. And I remember crying my eyes out to some girls that I met at a bus stop being, please, can you help me? And I remember telling them what had happened and saying, this has happened. 
and they freaked out like they started crying because they didn't know how to deal with the situation that I was telling them anyway I was very lucky and I remember telling the police and everything that happened and they said to me Carly I don't know what happened to you that night but you're one of the lucky ones and this story doesn't always end like this and like you Paris I stopped drinking for a year I stopped eating meat I couldn't eat meat I, I literally stopped all of this stuff because living in London a girl in London like I was never from there originally like you realize that you have to keep your wits about you but this stuff happens and it's very real and I think you know for anyone that's been through this it's one of those things that you don't feel right for a long time because you can't piece together what actually happened you don't know what happened you, you know don't. You don't. But it changed me forever. Like it changed me forever. I don't know if it did with you. Probably the same. Completely. I never. It took all you can now do is connect. You know that same joy everyone's got when they're DJing, they're drinking after. That's that's never again for you. Like, and all I the next day, all I thought about was, oh my god, I have a human at home. I was like, is this what the hell? And you think to yourself, God, what the hell happened? And I still, to this day, I'm like, all I remember, as you say, is flashes. Like, I remember seeing someone and people going, and to the point people found it funny because I've never been like that before. And rather than look at that and, you know, question, like, you know, as you say, where, where were people looking for you? Like, it's one minute she was in the club, next minute she was gone. Like, where was your support? Like, people don't think we have a female DJ here. And they don't think about this chain of events that could happen. Carly, thank you for sharing. Wow, this is really, this is really intense. Thank that you is, for sharing that. Is, that. That's really brave. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, don't I feel, be sorry. I feel because... pretty, don't be, yeah, I feel pretty shook by you sharing that. Like I've, I, I've been spiked and, and I kind of feel like I'm, I'm one of the lucky ones because I was, I literally knew it was happening when it happened. Do you know what I mean? Like I'd gone out and the worst thing is I'd gone out with a bunch of, and I've not really shared this before. I'd gone out with a bunch of guys from school that I know really, really well. So I've always been a bit of a tomboy. I always hang out with the guys and we went to Yates's on West street in Brighton. And then we went to the event and I hadn't had much to drink back then. I didn't drink much, probably drink more, drink more now. Um, but I knew that I wasn't drunk. Do you know, it's that, it's where you're like, this isn't me and I know this isn't me and this isn't how I behave. And then I was, I was out of my mind. Like I was just fucking wasted and I had to go to a payphone. Sorry, that's not so much. Um, my son can't hear. I had to go to a payphone and I phoned my ex-boyfriend who I knew would just come and get me. Like I just knew he'd come and get me. So I phoned him from a payphone. He came and got me. And I remember just lying on his lounge floor, just spinning out and I don't remember much else but I caught it do you know what I mean like I, I but it definitely wasn't me it definitely I hadn't created that situation by having too much to drink like it's a horrible thing and it's horrible because I was out with a bunch of men I know um and that's what really got me about it is I hadn't been with anybody else I've been with like 10 guys from, that I used to go to school with but thank you both so much for sharing and I'm really sorry that you had those experiences like that's really yeah, I feel a bit shook by that. Listening to the, the listening to both of your stories, just the, I just can't imagine what you what you must have both went through. Um, and it's, it's it just shows that things have got to change, and men, us men, have to have this conversation. We have to be aware. When I was growing up, when I was I grew up in an era where I'd be walking down the road behind a lady late at night, and I'd cross the road. So she felt safe. And at the time, I, f I was angry about it. I was like, oh, she probably thinks I'm going to grab her bag. I was a little bit resentful about it. But you know what? I'm really glad that I grew up like that. And I'm really glad that I've done that. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm really, really glad because it's only too recently, me as a guy, I can look and say, do you know what? I could put myself in a woman's position. Before, I wasn't looking at it from that way. I know a lot of guys don't look at it from that. They just look at it from their side of things. Why should I have to? But come on, guys, we can do better. You're hearing what's going on. Women do not feel safe, yeah? I'm going to say something. We can't tell by looking at someone if they're a predator or not. Therefore, women need to be hypervigilant as us men need to respect the fact that women may have to assume me when I hurt them. As a decent man, it might be a tough to swallow, but from speaking to my female friends, it seems a given thing. 
So I have to assume my daughters and my other female friends feel the same. The one man on that street that Sarah Everard should have felt safe with committed the ultimate offence against her. He would have been taught the body language and tools to instill trust in her. This isn't about men feeling uncomfortable when women avoid them on the street. It's about protecting women. So what can we do? Guys, we have to do better. Me, I, I have to do better. Right, I've, I've been guilty of a wolf whistle. All right, love, we have to do better. All of us men have to do better, right? Listen to this show. If you're one of those guys that are that are that are being abusive, whether physical or mentally, to your woman during lockdown, have a look at yourself. Talk to someone. Get help. You can get help for this. Yeah, it is not cool. Men need to have this conversation. We need to be more understanding of what women go through late at night on the street when they're walking down the road or whenever they feel threatened. Come on, guys, we can do better, all right? Listen, guys, welcome along and thank you so much for taking part today in the Frost Report. I've, I'm really grateful for all of everything you shared and for giving me an insight into um, a, lot of, a lot of things that need to change, yeah? Um, Paris, Ellie... Carly and Catherine, thank you so much for taking part. I love you all and God bless you. And I'll see you all soon. All right. Thank Peace. You. Listen, thank guys, um, thank you so much. Um, this this has been a very, very deep and emotional episode of the Frost Report. I'll be back next month with four of the biggest names in German Bass to talk about their um experiences with mental health um it's been a it's been a deep one i just want to thank you all for locking in and thank you once again um ladies it's been an absolute pleasure thank you you bless me thank you very much peace I get high, I get high, I get high of your memory I get high